Good afternoon. I'm Professor Elizabeth Prodromo from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy from the Initiative on Religion, Law and Diplomacy. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to the third in our conversation series on cultural heritage and crisis. Uh, today, uh, we have three superb panelists with us and we continue in a, a series that's been fascinating from its outset. Um, we are sponsoring this, we're co-sponsoring this uh, series with um, the Foreign Affairs Institute in Athens, Greece. And there's been an organizing committee with myself, Mr. Lukas Katsonis from the Foreign Affairs Institute and Reverend Dr. Vasilios uh, uh, Grikas from uh, the National and Capodistrian University in, um, in Athens. So it's a pleasure to have everyone on board with us and we look forward to today's conversation. We have three uh, wonderful uh, speakers today who are gonna talk to us about the issue of religious cooperation and cultural heritage sustainability. And as with the previous panels, the speakers come from a range of professional uh, and institutional spaces. We're going to begin today with His Eminence Archbishop Elpidophoros Lambriniadis of America. He is the Exarch of the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople, and he is the Archbishop of the Greek Orthodox Church in America. Um, we are going to follow then uh, with Ms. Tess Davis, who is the Executive Director of the Antiquities Coalition. Uh, the Antiquities Coalition uh, is an institution in Washington, D.C., and she oversees the, the work of the Antiquities Coalition in fighting cultural racketeering, and she manages all of the programmatic and operational work of, of the Institute. And then finally, we're going to conclude with Mr. Mazen Karam, who is the Managing Director and CEO, Chief Executive Officer of the Bethlehem Development Foundation in Bethlehem. Uh, he has he manages all of the work of the of the BDF, their projects, uh, and he has overseen the initiative for the um, the rehabilitation of the uh, Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. So you can see all of their bios online. I don't want to spend our time together going through a longer bio. I want to invite each of them to begin with an opening statement, and then we will open to Q and A. So I encourage all of you who are viewing. Uh, to populate the, the Q&A or the chat with your questions, and we'll share those as we continue forward in conversation. And I want to thank all of you from New York to New Orleans to Bethlehem for being with us, and also thank our uh, wonderful tech team and intern team today, uh, Cecilia C.C. Um, Rosenman is with us. So with no further ado, Your Eminence, uh, why don't you start us today um, with, your, with your observations and remarks? Uh, thank you, dear Dr. Podromu. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Dr. Podromu, our convener and moderator, and of course, faculty director on religion, law, and diplomacy at the Fletcher School. Dear friend, Mason Karam, CEO of the Bethlehem Development Foundation. Dear Tess Davis, executive director of the Antiquities Collection. Dear participants and colleagues, I am delighted and I'm grateful to be with you here today via these wonders of technology. I want to thank my friend, Dr. Paul Romu, Mr. Lucas Katsonis, the president of the Foreign Affairs Institute in Greece, and the very Reverend Aristarchos Grekas, professor at the National and Capodistrian University of Athens, uh, for their effort and exertion to make this important conference and conversation possible, especially in these trying times of a global pandemic. Uh, indeed, it is the crisis of COVID-19 that brings us together in this extraordinary way, and not just demonstrating our interconnectivity, something those of us familiar with the global village have known for a while now. Indeed, the pandemic has been a painful lesson in our interdependence, which is much more than mere connectedness through commerce and finance. Our interdependency, our relationality, as if I'm, I'm allowed to say that word, relationality, this is a fundamental truth of our existence on and 
with this planet we inhabit and with this universe we are sailing through at remarkable if unfelt speed. It is regrettable that we are learning this hard lesson through the loss of life and through the illness of our fellow human beings. As His All Holiness, our Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew has been saying for decades, and I quote his words, a new approach and a new culture are indeed based on the centrality of the human person within creation and inspired by environmentally ethical behavior stemming from our triple relationship to God, to God, to self, and to creation. Such an ethics fosters interdependence, says the Patriarch, and stresses the principles of universal solidarity, social justice, and responsibility in order to promote a true culture of life. These are the words of our Patriarch. And so it is that we find ourselves united in shared suffering and common cause in the course of this pandemic. And in this context, I raise again words that I shared in the presence of my co-panelist, Mr. Mason Karam, when we were together at the Bethlehem Development Foundation benefit dinner six months ago, when I said, and I asked, can there be a more sacred ministry than this to preserve and defend the holy topos, the sacred locus of an entire history? That was my question then, six months ago, which brings me to Hagia Sophia today and the situation as it exists today. We may know what, uh, you may know that I was in, born in Constantinople, in today modern Istanbul. And you know that I spent my early childhood there and not only that, but also I served 25 years after that in the court of the Ecumenical Patriarchy, nearly all my ecclesiastical ministry, 25 years. What is most disappointing about this development for me is that as we battle the global threat of COVID-19, the mindset of conquest, the mindset of empire still prevails and is the thrust behind the reconversion of the Hagia Sophia to mosque. Truly, my friends, we have not come very far. I hope our conversation today can reveal new heretofore unheard perspectives that can advance the interests of all, of all of us who wish for modern civilization to engage in defense against our real enemies, not the imaginative fantasies of the past that should be thankfully behind us as a species. I look forward to listening, to learning, and the dialogue that ensures. Thank you, Dr. Prodromo. Thank you, Your Eminence, and thank you for starting us off with um, uh, wonderful reflections that amplify the importance of justice and universality and the kinds of issues that we're discussing here with cultural and religious heritage. And I know that uh, we'll, we'll uh, follow these up as we continue the discussion. So thank you so much, Your Eminence, for starting us off. And now, Tessa, I turn to you. Good afternoon. And, and first, I'd like to thank the Fletcher School at Tufts, as well as the Foreign Affairs Institute of Greece, for this opportunity to join such distinguished experts and, and truly global leaders in discussing such an important topic. And of course, that is religious cooperation and cultural heritage. Again, my name is Tess Davis, and I'm executive director of the Antiquities Coalition. Our not-for-profit organization and think tank is dedicated to combating the illicit trade in ancient art and artifacts, which is funding crime, conflict, and violent extremism around the world, and where business leaders, former government officials, archaeologists, lawyers, counterterrorism experts, and other professionals who 
recognize that crimes against culture are a threat not just to our shared heritage, but also to global security, to national economies, and to the legitimate art market as well. And in our mission, we've been very honored to join forces with a wide range of partners, including the United Nations, the US government, foreign governments around the world, law enforcement agencies here and overseas, museums and art market leaders. Uh, now, of course, people of faith have much to lose from this illicit trade. One need only flip through the pages of an auction catalog or even scroll through a site such as eBay to see that sales are full of sacred objects which were never meant to be bought and sold, and yet, nonetheless, are being hawked to the highest bidder. Of course, as long as we've had tombs, we've had tomb raiders, and as long as there have been civilizations, there have been enemy armies waiting to plunder them. Culture has always been used as a weapon of war. Think of so many of the sites that we've seen destroyed by Daesh in recent years. Many have been sacked, sometimes many times before. However, today, throughout the Middle East, North Africa, and beyond, Culture is increasingly a criminal, insurgent, and terrorist financing tool. Like conflict diamonds in Africa, blood antiquities are cultural objects that are looted from archaeological sites or stolen from collections, be that in museums or often in religious institutions, and then trafficked by armed groups to finance hostilities or exploit them for personal gain. And this cultural racketeering, as we call it, it's erasing millennia of history, and it's putting money into the pockets of brutal dictatorships, rebel armies, drug cartels, and violent extremist organizations around the world. Now, Daesh has made international headlines for its highly developed trade, but they weren't the first and they won't be the last. Indeed, if we look at some of the worst actors of the past century, from the Nazis to the Khmer Rouge to the Irish Republican Army to the Tamil Tigers, the Taliban, the Al Nusra Front, Al Qaeda, the Houthi militias, and, and even the Brussels bombers, we'll see that all of these groups have been implicated in the looting or theft of cultural property. Of course, confusing the situation is that many of the same groups on that list, as well as others who are financing their operations through the illicit trade and cultural property, they're also targeting cultural, historic, and religious sites for destruction. And it's critical to remember that these attacks against heritage, they're meant first and foremost as attacks against people. After all, once you destroy all, all that all people hold sacred, the next step is without fail to destroy the people themselves. And so you erase not only your enemies, but all evidence of them. And that is why these cultural crimes are atrocity crimes in and of themselves, and also why they are warning signs of worse atrocities to come, including crimes against humanity, war crimes, and even genocide. And as with all atrocity crimes, Ethnic, racial, and religious minority groups are particularly at risk. And as we've seen with the Daesh and the Taliban in particular, um, such attacks can also make for dangerous propaganda for bad actors. Yet yeah, once more, it's important to stress that the same fundamentalists who publicly claim to destroy antiquities as idols on camera have shown to have no problem selling them behind the scenes. Again, this intentional destruction and cultural plunder go hand in hand. The Middle East and North Africa is a cradle of civilization, art, writing, law, and so many of the world's faiths has much to lose from these crimes against culture. And indeed, many of the sites and objects that have been targeted by looters and traffickers are sacred to one of the Abrahamic faiths and sometimes to all of them. But it's in closing, it's important to remember that this is a global problem. All peoples with a heritage worth protecting are at risk of having it stolen and thieves are targeting Buddhist temples in Cambodia, Hindu sculptures in India, Orthodox icons in Albania, Protestant churches in Egypt, in England, Islamic manuscripts in Libya, um, Hopi figures in the United States, colonial crucifixes in Mexico, really the, the list goes on. And this is an issue that should unite, and as we're hearing today, is uniting people of faith across the world. And while there are many challenges, there are also many opportunities for us today, which we look forward to discussing. Thank you.
Yes, thank you. That was that was really wonderful, and thank you for providing the kind of uh, the perspective that shows that what we're discussing here is global in scope. The challenges are certainly global in scope, and they cut across faith and cultural communities and traditions. Um, against the backdrop of the decision about Hagia Sophia in, in Istanbul, Constantinople, um, you've, which is a specific example, that's a window into the globality of, uh, of the issues as, as well. And we'll go now to Mazen because I think both you and His Eminence, Tess, have emphasized the fact that we're not just talking about artifacts or sites or places, we're talking about the importance of those as connectors to living sustainable communities. And Mazen, your work with the BDF, I think, beautifully amplifies and illustrates that connection between place and living community. So um, we invite you now to, to speak as well. Thank you, Dr. Prodron, for the introduction. Thanks to the organizers uh, at the Fletcher School at Tufts University and to the Foreign Affairs Office Greece for hosting such a valuable discussion series defying the lockdown caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, thank you for including the Battle of Foundation and believe in what BDF stands for in relation with cultural preservation of heritage. I thank His Eminence, my good friend, uh, uh, Sayyidna Padovoros. Uh, good to see you again. It's very true, six months ago, you said these exact words, and I kept wondering uh, what else can we do after your uh, kind words and your wisdom. Uh, we have a lot to do, Your Eminence. And thank you, Tess Davis, for enlightening us with the words of truth and for your global view as Elizabeth has mentioned. I'm not going to be as global as you. We have a lot to offer here in Palestine. Uh, as you know, cultural heritage is preserved through movable and immovable properties. Examples here in Palestine are abundant. It takes a lot to care for these uh, historical cultural properties. Monuments of architecture, art, and history. We have the magnificent cathedrals. We have monasteries, we have the Dome of the Rock, archaeological sites, we are abundantly found throughout historic Palestine. The groups of buildings, which as a whole are of historical or artistic interest. <clears throat> we have the Aqsa Mosque uh, complex, we have the Solomon Pools complex, we have the Church of Nativity complex, and the Holy Sepulchre complex. Uh, manuscripts, books, and other objects of artistic, historical, archaeological interest. We have abundance of these too. The Dead Sea Scrolls, the mosaic floors of Fishan's Palace, the intricate mosaics of the Dome of the Rock, uh, and buildings uh, which host all these the museums. We have also a host of museums. Uh, it's, we are lucky we, to have UNESCO as a, a protection agency for the cultural heritage. The great, those of great importance to humanity are further protected by UNESCO. We have the Holy Church of Nativity, including Manger Square and the Patriarch's Christmas Procession Route as one of them. And also we have Batir Village, the cultivation and irrigation system dating back 2,500 years is another one. So not all uh, cultural heritage is uh, religious, some is secular like Batir. Uh, here in Palestine, we uh, showcasing our heritage is our bread and butter. We are living it day by day. When there is peace, our economy thrives. When there is war, our cultural property, religious and secular, is threatened. So we hang on until the threat is removed. We struggle to preserve heritage in the collective memory of the people. However, the occupation by Israel is continually erasing sites from 130 Palestinian villages were destroyed in 1948, which means that generations born after 1948 cannot relate to their heritage. You know, each village has a well dug in rock, each village has a taboon, the oven that makes bread, each village has a house where it all met. Each village on its own has its own heritage. Uh, other than that, we have examples of heritage and danger by, I mean, Rachel's tomb, for example. 
is venerated by all three monotheistic religions, but now it's carved out from the Palestinian area as serving only the Jewish community. Herodian Palace east of Bethlehem is the same. It's, it was taken from the Palestinians. So the, con the occupation is continuously uh, threatening cultural heritage of the Palestinians. Uh, demolishing hill, uh, houses around the, uh, Jerusalem and the city of Silwan in an attempt to find David's city is demolishing Palestinian heritage. So uh, the challenges are big, uh, but I wanted to mention that occupation and war are the biggest threat to, uh, to our cultural heritage. Um, I want to talk about the champions of cultural heritage. Who is preserving the cultural heritage? The first and foremost champion of culture, cultural heritage are the indigenous people. Two examples. The Tyr inhabitants were the people who started this irrigation system 2,500 years ago. And they maintained that for 2,500 years. And it's still going on. And they, the same people, descendants of 2,500 years ago, were the people who applied to UNESCO get approved as a World Heritage Site. So thanks to, to them for preserving that fear. The same thing, the Bethlehemites, despite series of wars and destruction to the Church of Nativity, which was built in the fourth century, they were able to keep in operation for 16 centuries. They too were the people who applied to UNESCO to enlist them as a World Heritage Site. And now we have the private sector. The private sector, the men who are working, supporting the restoration of the Church of Nativity, uh, which we support too at PDF. Uh, but I want to single out the late Saeed Khouri. He's a devout Orthodox Christian who launched the Bethlehem Development Initiative. Uh, his vision was to regenerate the holy city of Bethlehem, to make this destination so, uh, to have sustainable economy and infrastructure, to showcase the Church of Nativity, the jewel of Bethlehem and Palestine and the world. The strategic action plan to regenerate Bethlehem was focused on eight sectors, but the pillar, the main pillar of the strategic action plan was cultural heritage preservation whether the church, whether the surrounding uh, churches, whether the uh, surrounding towns and the inner cities, the old cities, and the three cities, uh, Beit Sahur, Beit Jal, and Bethlehem, which each one of them has great importance in Christianity. Beit Sahur being the, where the shepherds came to Bethlehem to greet Jesus, and Beit Jal was the home of St. Nicholas, who later on became Santa Claus, and of course, Bethlehem, the birthplace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the holiest, then we have the holiest of the holy, the church of the Holy Sepulchre, which was divested from Bethlehem, the twin city of Jerusalem, through the separation wall. Uh, this wall that was built between Bethlehem and Jerusalem prevents people to cross over and go to visit Jerusalem. The procession route starts from Jerusalem and crosses the wall at Mar Elias and then continues to Bethlehem. So now this has been divested, but, uh, but preservation work is ongoing, as, as well as efforts to create peace between Israel and Palestine to enable everybody to, uh, to worship in peace. The procession, the Katizma, which uh, Dr. Prodromo has seen in person with the Virgin Mary rested as they fled to Egypt, is also divested from Bethlehem. So these, all these uh, important monuments that I mentioned, at every site mentioned, CCC, led by the late Said Khouri and now by his son, uh, Samir Khouri, and his uh, whole family are supporting, are involved in one way or another to preserve these sites. Uh, I think uh, with the, your support, God's support, everybody's support, we will not, uh, not uh, lose any of these sites again like we are 
hoping not to lose uh, Agia Sophia. Uh, I like to share uh, uh, a small graph that my friend sent to me, but I'll explain it. Heritage, the heritage cycle starts from the entire side, comes a thirst to understand. So when you understand it, then you value it. When you value it, then you want to care for it. And when you care for it, then it will help people enjoy it again. So this is what we're trying to do, to move the whole cycle to come back to enjoy the heritage cycle. Thank you. Thank you, Mazen. And thank you for um, also highlighting um, this difference between violence and nonviolence and the way in which violent circumstances certainly present um, a threat to cultural and religious heritage as a kind of universal gift, but also nonviolent circumstances that can be equally pernicious and negative in terms of their effects on, um, on preservation and sustainability. And I'd like to turn back to that, to that question. And um, I, I don't want the whole discussion to be about Hagia Sophia, but certainly since it's been in the news uh, and there's been a huge kind of media attention to Hagia Sophia, I wonder if we could say a little bit about that and discuss that to begin with. There are a couple of questions also that directly uh, relate to Hagia Sophia, and then we'll move on from that. And so I'd like to ask you, Your Eminence, um, to begin in terms of uh, how it is that uh, the importance of supporting Hagia Sophia as a uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, respecting the requirements of uh, World Heritage designation is also important for the sustainability of a living community, certainly the Greek Orthodox community, but all faith communities and non-believers as well in Turkey. Can you say a little bit about your own experience with the importance of preserving that site and what it means for the living community um, of, of Christians in Turkey. Thank you, uh, Dr. Prodromo. Uh, the, it's not, Ikea Sophia's conversion to a mosque is not just uh, an issue that concerns only the Orthodox or the Greek Orthodox Christians in, in Istanbul or, or all over the world. It brings a new mentality, uh, it brings a, a new uh, approach on how we treat religious sites and monuments. And that is something that uh, uh, for me it's alarming and it's dangerous and I'm, I will explain why. It brings the element of the conqueror, of the conqueror's right on a religious site. And the, the idea of, from the Turkish side is that since I am the conqueror of this place, I own all the religious sites and I can deal with them uh, the way it pleases me and it pleases my conqueror rights. After 85 years of, uh, of uh, museum status and after almost 100 years of the Turkish Republic, which is a secular and modern country and democratic uh, state, going back to the mentality of the conqueror uh, of 1453 is, is a huge uh, step back in the history. It, it brings uh, elements uh, in modern life uh, from the past that we all thought they were uh, already overcome and we thought that we had a progress in in modern societies and that we do not, we are not based on the mentality of the conquerors and of the sword right, but on um, uh, secular states with modern democratic values and respect to the heritage and to the history of each monument. Uh, can you imagine if we apply this um, uh, societies today, uh, do we really think uh, that uh, our, uh, that anybody who conquers a geographical area? Your Eminence, we're having problems with, with your sound. We're having problems with your sound, Your Eminence. Okay. How is the connection now? Is it better? A little bit, yes. You were freezing before. 
Okay. I'm sorry. No, it's uh, okay. Is it, do we really believe today that uh, we have the right a, in a military way to conquer a geographical area and then to deal with everything uh, cultural or with all the monuments that exist in this area in the way that it pleases us and our interests? Do we have rights to, to deal in any way uh, with these monuments? This is something that concerns us and it's alarming for everybody, not only for the Greeks, not only for the Christians, not only for Orthodox, but for everybody who cares about monuments and religious heritage. Thank you, thank you. I, I wonder if I could ask either Mazen or Tess to follow up on this. And Tess, there's also a question um, specifically um, directed to you from our audience, which is related, which uh, has to do with, <clears throat> and I'm not sure if this is something you've been following, but uh, the proposal for a cultural uh, a memorandum of understanding between the uh, government of Turkey and the United States on cultural property. And I know that uh, cultural heritage, I know that the Association of Art Museum Directors has uh, submitted a statement to uh, the State Department uh, opposing uh, that kind of a memorandum of understanding um, because of what it might imply, again, for potentially trafficking or ownership over in a kind of conquest mentality of cultural heritage. Is this something that you are aware of or following and have something that, you know, uh, from the perspective of the Antiquities Coalition to, to discuss? Yes, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss them because welcome the chance. Um, I think these are important agreements to highlight and something that can actually help with some of the problems that are being discussed today. And also welcome the opportunity to correct misinformation that is continuing to circulate about these agreements and what they do. Uh, first of all, for those on the webinar today who aren't familiar with these, um, these bilateral agreements are a tool to fight the illicit trade while increasing responsible cultural exchange. And what they do is they restrict the import of stolen, looted, or undocumented cultural property from at-risk countries into the United States, and this is fully in accordance with international law and best practices, while allowing the trade in documented cultural objects, those with export permits, those whose ownership is determined, um, to continue. And again, there's a great deal of misinformation out there about these. Um, first of all is that they're retroactive. They're not. They only work from the date forward. So cultural property that was removed from these countries in earlier times um, by, by minority groups or by anyone, um, it's not subject to the terms of this agreement. And again, so long as cultural objects are documented, the trade in these, the entry into the United States can continue. But the other thing that I think it's important to highlight about these agreements is that they do open the doors for dialogue and exchange between the United States and other countries with them, including Turkey. And the State Department, quite rightly, has really prioritized in these discussions um, encouraging other countries to respect the cultural rights of all peoples within their borders. And so these agreements don't create ownership rights, um, but rather they provide another mechanism through which the State Department and through which groups in America um, can increase dialogue about this issue. And so these are agreements that, that we do support and they've increasingly found uh, support within the market community and certainly from museums as well for this reason. Thank you, Tess. I, I want to um, pivot off of that to, to you, Mazen, as well. Um, I wondered if you could say a little bit more. Um, we, we're bringing in different stakeholders. His Eminence talked about governments and local communities. Tess is talking about um, MOUs, Memoranda of Understanding, and raising awareness. I, I want to go back to your points about the work of the Bethlehem Development Foundation um, and how to raise awareness about the work that you do, because I think part of the the challenge in terms of preserving sites and also sustaining communities is that the wider communities and the international community and educational spaces as well as practitioner experts oftentimes don't know what's happening on the ground. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the ways in which the work of the BDF aims to educate people and who are, who are the communities that need to be educated about the projects on which you're working. It is an ongoing uh, process of uh, fundraising 
coming back here, working to develop and uh, restore uh, historic sites. Uh, we were successful uh, to raise a good amount of money to complete the restoration works at the Church of Nativity. And to do that, we had to uh, come to America and we did uh, um, a fundraising dinner in 2018, uh, early 2018, two more in, in December 2018, and two more in 2020. Uh, so we've been working hard on fundraising for the church. Now the church is complete, but we need uh, to raise uh, funds for additional churches. We have plans for the Catisma. Uh, we have plans for the burial place of St. Stephen's, uh, which happens to be in Ramallah, not in any of the places that uh, we are used to, Bethlehem or Jerusalem. So our work uh, is uh, raising awareness about the, these sites. But the only way to raise awareness is by having people come and visit in person. Uh, we are now uh, in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. People cannot come to enjoy what we have done the past seven years. Uh, but when, uh, when the pandemic is over, I hope people can come and enjoy these uh, places. We have uh, uh, the organization is in Bethlehem. Uh, we have a website. We have uh, a lot of uh, material to offer when you visit our websites. Uh, we have the American Friends of Bethlehem Development Foundation also uh, support us in many of the fundraising uh, dinners. So we work hard in, in trying to uh, complete the strategic action plan, which needs a lot of money. So money, resources are the main issue for us, and this is what we try to do most. When we get uh, funding, we can do miracles. So, but I want to say one thing about uh, Agia Sophia, and I think that UNESCO needs to be more empowered. Uh, Agia Sophia is a World Heritage Site, and UNESCO could not do anything. What bothers me is that this decision by uh, Caliphate Erdogan was political. He wanted to boost his. Uh, wanted to boost his uh, popularity. So I think he's acting like an emperor, he's acting like a sultan, uh, doing this unilaterally to promote his uh, political agenda. This is what hurts. Treating some, uh, something like the Hagia Sophia in such a manner uh, is really hurting. And I like to see UNESCO more empowered uh, to, to prevent this to stop it, say, no, you cannot. And as his eminence said, uh, if you conquer does not mean you have the right to do whatever you want in any way, like the Holy Sepulchre. You're not allowed to do what you want to do as a, an occupation. Uh, still, it is governed by the three churches. Uh, the same in the Church of Nativity, it's governed by the three churches. Church, this is non-governmental uh, issue. Can, can I ask, following up on, on this issue of, you mentioned UNESCO, one of the themes which has come up in the previous two um, segments of this series has been the issue of compliance. And, uh, and Tess, you talked about memoranda of understanding as an opportunity for dialogue, um, but then there's also the, the need for, um, for compliance. And I wondered if um, you could say a little bit about any, any of you about um, the, the possibility of recognizing the rights of religious groups, communities, and individuals, um, not just nation states, to preserve their cultural heritage. Uh, would that, would that um, improve compliance mechanisms? Would it improve the kind of dialogue and multi-faith and religious and non-religious cooperation that all of you are hinting at? And maybe we'll start with you, Tess, and then we'll go to your eminence and come back to Mazen. Um, what do you see as potential solutions to the kinds of challenges that all of you are raising, because it's clear that compliance is a problem. Well, I think you've hit upon here, perhaps the, the most difficult 
issue um, in cultural heritage today, and that comes down to, to ownership and, and who owns the past. Uh, as we know, international law has increasingly recognized that cultural rights are human rights, but which is a wonderful and long overdue recognition, but it still provides very few answers on who decides what cultural heritage is and who controls it. How does the law protect these cultural rights? And as we're hearing in this conversation today, what happens when the cultural rights of one group conflict with those of another? And this, this, these questions, um, they're important to cultural heritage management, they're important to religious communities, but it's also getting into a wider discussion about the role of states and non-state actors that we're seeing across the board, across just about every international issue today, whether we're talking about you know, the destruction of cultural property or whether we're just talking about the destruction of the rainforest. Um, and so I, I would say this is the top issue today in the field because everything else is, is tied to it. Um, it's one for which I wish I had more answers. Um, as we know, states are central to international law, but I think it is time to, to have this discussion and, and to debate it. And it's important to bring in all voices and um, I welcome the other thoughts as well. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Your, your eminence, I mean, when it comes to compliance, I think the, the spaces in which you live and, and, and operate imply compliance a voluntary kind of compliance across faith communities. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about whether you're experiencing support and cooperation across interfaith, ecumenical uh, lines when it comes to the Hagia Sophia question, and therefore generate a kind of grassroots citizen and communal compliance that is, is voluntary in nature, but which in fact has an impact. Uh, thank you, Dr. Podromo. Uh, it is really amazing how much support we have from all kinds of uh, the, the uh, partners on uh, interreligious and ecumenical level. We have not only here in the United States, but all over the world. I just want to mention what happened here in the United States. Not only the uh, partial synod of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, but uh, the whole uh, assembly of the Orthodox bishops of all uh, jurisdictions in the United States, uh, we published a statement supporting uh, uh, and condemning, uh, supporting the, the idea that it's, it was a bad idea to convert Hagia Sophia to mosque. Uh, we had a very uh, important support from the, the Roman Catholic Church Pope made a very strong statement on that, His Holiness. Um, and here uh, with the Cardinal of New York uh, uh, published uh, we, together with me a common statement uh, supporting the idea of Hagia Sophia remaining a, a, a museum. And the most encouraging for me was the telephone call I had with uh, uh, the president, uh, Syed, uh, uh, Syed, who is the president of the Islamic Society of North America, and who uh, published also, it was not just a, a, a telephone call, that we had a, um, an official statement from them saying that this is not an expression of Islamic faith to reconvert Hagia Sophia to mosque. All these expressions are encouraging and they indicate the international interest and the international conflict to even to the idea of the Islam, that this decision was not compatible with the Islamic belief on how we treat the, uh, the, the uh, religious sites and religious monuments like Hagia Sophia. Thank you. That's, that's very encouraging to hear that there's that kind of interfaith and ecumenical um, solidarity um, around the site as a world heritage site and a gift to the world um, as well as uh, a cultural heritage site within Turkey. And I want to ask you then, Mazen, the same thing. Um, you know, his eminence, I think, highlights that civilizational language and discourse on, you know, world heritage sites is um, divisive rather than producing the kind of um, sharing and, and solidarity we wish. And so in the space of, um, of uh, Bethlehem and the, and, and the Palestinian territories, can you tell us a little bit about Abrahamic cooperation and what your experience has been 
um, rather than the kind of standard civilizational um, presentation that we oftentimes hear in the media. Do you see interfaith cooperation? And then also, do you see, uh, tell us a little bit more about the public-private cooperation that you mentioned earlier. Where are there signs of, of positive development rather than division? Uh, 2009, when the idea of the restoration of the Church of Nativity started, uh, it was very difficult to work uh, on that because the Church is controlled by the Roman Catholic, the Greek Orthodox, and the Armenian Orthodox. And it was very difficult to get them together. And finally, by a presidential degree, decree, uh, a presidential committee was established to oversee the restoration of the works. And this was the only way for the works to start. So something to come from above to control these divisive uh, uh, attitudes was needed. Now after, uh, in 2020, uh, 11 years later, the churches are working better because they were able together under the supervision of the presidential committee to come up with a great work of restoration. So this was uh, uh, a good sign of how you can solve interfaith problem within the Christian community. Now within the interfaith with Christians and Muslims, all every, the Muslims in Palestine are against the uh, declaring the Hagia Sophia as a mosque uh, because we suffer here with these problems. We have the Abraham, uh, the Abraham Mosque in, the, in, uh, in Hebron. Uh, it's a Muslim mosque. Okay, it was built by pagans before 2000 years ago and then was converted to a church and then to a mosque. Uh, but now it's shared by Muslims and uh, Jews. But because they are the conquerors, were able to do that. If they were not the conquerors, they would not be able to do that. I'll go back to his eminence point that conqueror can do anything. So the first solution to protect her cultural heritage is to end the occupation. For us in Palestine specifically to end the occupation. For the world, UNESCO should be empowered to have like a police force, not a police force, an army, whatever it was in the in the first panel this was discussed by one of your uh, speakers that somebody should be empowered to protect cultural health is like the uh, agreement that uh, Ms. Davis uh, talked about. Uh, there should be uh, somebody at United Nations level that will be able to prevent this uh, from happening. If there is no war, no occupation, the Abrahamic religions will work perfectly before 1948. My parents uh, in Ramle, we had Christians, uh, neighbors, Muslim neighbors, and Jewish neighbors. And all three were living together happily. The only introduction was the war and the eviction of the Palestinians from Palestine in 1948. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May, um, I, may I uh, bring an, another di dimension uh, to this discussion? Absolutely. Uh, there are monuments in the history that are of shared experiences from different religions. And Hagia Sophia is an example. Nobody can ignore that for almost 500 years, Hagia Sophia was a mosque. And Muslims have a very strong feeling for Hagia Sophia. But again, 1,000 years, uh, Christianity uh, was, again, uh, it was a cathedral for the uh, uh, Christians. In this kind of, uh, of, uh, of monuments, we need to offer an option that will not hurt either part and will equally offer the possibility for both or all religions who, have, who are connected with a monument in this way or another. And I don't want to judge if it is the right of the conqueror or not. I just go and see, I'm seeing that in a very neutral way. It's a monument that was shared in the history by two major religions. There is, there is no uh, wiser uh, decision than Ataturk to say, okay, let's live in peace now. We are a modern secular society. We founded the new Turkish Republic. Ottoman Empire has collapsed. 
Let's live in peace together, Christians, Muslims, Armenians, whatever nationalities we are, and let's share this monument, have equal access to that monument as a museum. That was a very wise decision. Uh, to change that decision, again, favors one uh, part of the history, and uh, which is not uh, favoring the, the social peace, and it's not a guarantee for the uh, religious um, freedom in Turkey, because it brings two categories of citizens for Turkey. The citizens that have the right to access that, that monument as, uh, uh, as uh, religious people, and those who are not able to, to pray in, the, in that monument. Uh, this is really uh, a danger I want to, uh, to, to bring in your attention. That's, thank you. That's a, that's a fantastic transition into one of the questions that has come in here. Thank you, Your Eminence. And the question was um, directed to Tess, but I think it, um, you've all touched on it. Uh, the question is from the listeners. It says, in your opinion, Tess, what would be the most effective kind of international legal instrument for combating antiquities, destruction, and trafficking? Or I guess for um, establishing a kind of commitment to shared spaces, as His Eminence just discussed. And the, the um, viewer mentioned blood diamonds and the Kimberley process, uh, which you can tell our audience what that's about, but the certification scheme to prevent um, you know, the sale and, uh, of, tra of conflict diamonds. So can you tell us a little bit about whether or not you could envision something like that by the international community when it comes to um, protection of sites or trafficking in artifacts looted from sites? Well, thank you for the question. With regards to the illicit trade in art and antiquities, um, as with all types of illicit trade, borders are really our, our best defense. Um, and so our organization strongly advocates um, that countries around the world, and especially those market nations, work to cut off cultural heritage you know, as a source of financing for these groups. The illicit trade is a demand-driven trade, and no illicit trade has ever been defeated at its source, no matter what you're talking about. It requires stifling that demand. And in the case of art and antiquities, a handful of countries control that demand. And so the stance that has been taken by groups from the United Nations Security Council to the European Union to UNESCO and, and the United States as well is to close borders to undocumented antiquities, particularly from countries in crisis. And we've seen that this can be quite effective. Uh, for example, uh, most of my work has actually been within the Kingdom of Cambodia and research there has shown that when the U.S put into place import restrictions on Cambodian cultural property. And again, these were not retroactive either. They were just from the date forward. Um, that sales of Cambodian antiquities dropped by 80% at a major New York auction house. And again, because these agreements allow the trade and documented material to continue, I think that the statistic has suggested that a lot of that material was undocumented and thus probably illegal. Um, so the United States, through these bilateral agreements, um, cuts off, we, you know, require documentation coming into the United States for close to 20 countries now. We have also import restrictions for Iraq and Syria through legislation, but there's still a number of global hotspots uh, that aren't addressed, Afghanistan being a key one. Um, and a, another tool that we think is very important, particularly in talking about countries and conflict, is that since cultural heritage provides such an important foundation for national reconciliation, for economic recovery, that its protection really needs to be explicitly incorporated into peacekeeping mandates and training, as well as post-conflict planning and uh, recovery trust funds. And this has happened in some places like Mali, um, but it hasn't happened in others. And this is a huge missed opportunity because as we know, um, to take again the example of Cambodia, Cambodia's cultural heritage was such a way for the country to rebuild itself, both in terms of its identity and in terms of recovering from the Civil War, and also you know, economically through tourism. And so it's really crucial that um, this being included in plans going forward, and it hasn't been. And 
And third, um, another thing that we think is very important is that crimes against culture should be criminally prosecuted along with other atrocity crimes, either through international tribunals or through domestic prosecutions. And this is starting to happen at the ICC as well. Um, but it's something that we, we do hope to continue because, as I said earlier, these crimes against culture, they're meant first and foremost as crimes against people. They're not meant as crimes against stones and inanimate objects. Uh, with these attacks, uh, violent extremists and others are trying to hurt people, um, and we need to recognize that. Thank you. Uh, Mazen or, or uh, Your Eminence, do you want to follow up on that at all? Um, we have. Um, we have some other questions coming in too, but is, do you want to footnote anything on that? Because I'd like to also turn us towards uh, cooperation and look at uh, one of the questions that we're getting is about um, inter-religious cooperation. Um, but anything more on compliance and the idea of you know, new regulatory frameworks? Because if not, I'm going to um, circle you both back to cooperation in a moment. There is a question for me, Elizabeth, but what that I think I answered that. Mm -hmm. Would you okay. also be able to speak to compliance with international law for cultural heritage preservation in the case of Israel Palestine? It appears that Israel tends to disregard international legal frameworks and assumes of a position of counter and rule uh, similar to what the Archbishop has described. Mazen, we're having a problem with your sound too. We yeah we've lost your sound. No, your I'm, I'm fine. Okay. I'm fine okay. now. Okay. Uh, so um, I think that and this is a very important case here. Uh, but also in cases like this, with, where war affected the cultural heritage tremendously, was in Iraq. The museums were ransacked and uh, stolen and uh, sent to the United States and so so uh, I want to emphasize that war and occupation are the biggest threat to cultural heritage. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's exactly the danger I was talking about, because if you approach the monuments with the mentality of the conqueror, uh, it, it gives you unlimited rights, uh, and uh, it gives you uh, rights that you don't have, because uh, you'd, uh, if, you, if you think you are the conqueror, then even you may think that you have the right to even to destroy or to, to, to alter it or to change the monument, which you are supposed to uh, respect because it's a monument. It's not a symbol of the conquered area or whatever. Uh, these are all anachronistic ideas that uh, the only thing they can do is they can revive and uh, bring fire back, revive the conflicts between religions and people which we want to live in the past and we want to see the monuments as places of reconciliation, dialogue and peaceful coexistence other than uh, uh, the place where we uh, exercise our superiority uh, to other groups of people either uh, claiming our conqueror rights or our uh, religious rights on any monument and on any place. All right, thank you. This this whole issue of you know what divides as opposed to what unites and conquest versus um, con those who conquer those who are conquered. We have a question on a similar vein. We've been tending to focus on the Middle East, and I'd like us to broaden out. And Tess, I appreciate your your global perspective and because of your experience around the world. So I want to ask a question that's Middle East related, and then ask you, Tess, if you have any experience of modeling, let's say, from the experience in Cambodia or other places that could be applied to the Middle East. So again, going back to the Middle East as a space of the Abrahamic traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, one of our uh, questioners uh, raises the issue of what's happening to the dispossession of indigenous uh, Jewish people from throughout the Middle East, the greater Middle East. And she raises the point that uh, there are reports emerging that um, months after the U.S. State Department signed an MOU with Yemen, um, that the indigenous Jewish community there is being cleansed out. So we go back to this issue of memoranda of understanding and state-to-state -state arrangements that are meant to 
generate cooperation and oftentimes have exactly the opposite result. Uh, we go to the Middle East as a specific region where there are three ancient faith traditions that have sites that can be shared or that should certainly at least be respected. And then finally, and we see a lot of failure and a little bit of success. So I wondered if you could say a little bit about the success points in the region from your experiences, and then also go, maybe your eminence, uh, Mazen just exited, I know he'll be back, but maybe your eminence, tell us a story about something positive uh, that can be modeled in the region, and then test maybe something from outside the region that can be brought back into the, the Middle East in terms of these three ancient faith uh, communities. So let's start with you, Your Eminence. Maybe um, an example or an experience that points to cooperation, uh, Muslim Jewish Christian cooperation, um, or any any you know subset of that in your experience and Mazen, and then we'll go to tests for the models that might be imported back into the region from where they've worked outside. Uh, I can share with you my experience from Istanbul, where I. I was born and raised, and I spent the last 25 years in the uh, service of the Ecumenical Patriarchate there. Uh, I had such a, a positive uh, experience all these years of, for, from the cooperation and the peaceful coexistence we had uh, in Istanbul among all uh, religions and denominations. Uh, you know that our ecumenical patriarch is uh, Bartholomew is a pioneer of the interreligious dialogue, and we have a long tradition as an institution to promote this coexistence, the peaceful dialogue with Islam, world Islam, not only locally in Istanbul, and with Judaism. And in in Istanbul, uh, as an institution, we always had uh, very uh, close relations. We shared our um, our major feasts, we visited each other, we shared the joy uh, of, uh, of the feast of each other, and we always gathered together to celebrate each feast, each religious uh, feast that we had, either uh, Judaism, either Jews or uh, Christians or Armenian or Muslims. Uh, how many times I remember, uh, it's endless, I don't remember, even remember the number of iftars that I attended, not only as a representative of the ecumenical patriarch, but sharing these iftar tables with the, uh, the Jewish representative, with the Armenian, with the Syriac, and we were all there together, and religion was never a reason of division or conflict, but rather an opportunity to, to be together and to share the joy. Uh, of being different and at the same time sharing the same uh, space, the same uh, city, the same uh, country. And that, that, will, that, that is something that I'm, we are very much concerned that will change now that the, the right of the conqueror and the mentality of the superior nation comes in to, uh, to that place, which really can destroy everything. It's not constructive. Your minutes, I'm going to follow up on your quote and then turn to Mazen now. The joy of being different, that's a phrase that we don't hear a lot in our world today. So I wonder if we can apply that, Mazen, to an experience you might have had then with the work of the BDF where that joy of being different is actually um, that you've, you've seen it in terms of Muslim, Christian, Jewish uh, cooperation, or at the very least conversation about the significance of sites for the sustainability of all three communities. I can say that there is interfaith dialogue between Christians and Muslims throughout because we live together as occupied people. Uh, when the state of Israel wants to declare a Jewish state, how can I sit and have interfaith with Jews? Uh, I mean, if, if the political are trying to do it a Jewish state, if there was no Jewish state and it's a secular state, then we can talk Christians, Jews, and uh, Muslims. We go pray together at the Abraham Mosque. Uh, we go pray together in Jerusalem. Uh, uh, there is nothing between the religions themselves. 
in, in Yemen want to tell uh, Sarah who posted this comment on uh, on the uh, Zoom that uh, the Houthis are also against Muslims, not only against uh, Jews. So they're not only cleansing uh, Jews, maybe cleansing uh, Muslims. And I don't know if there are Christians in Yemen or not. But uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there is many Jews who want to go back to Yemen because they feel better in their indigenous land, Yemen, and not in Israel. Israel has encouraged the Jews to come from all over the uh, Arab world and come to build Israel occupied on Palestinian land and occupying places uh, taken over from Palestinian Christian and Muslims. So uh, ending occupation can bring in interfere dialogue from three religious, three monotheist religions. Um, uh, as being different, yes, we are different. Uh, each one has his own uh, uh, places, the Muslim, the Christian, the uh, Jew. Each one is trying to preserve his uh, place and proud of it, and the others are enjoying it too. Uh, I know Muslims will share with us, uh, they are in the front rows in every celebration. Holy life. Saturday, they are there. Christmas lighting tree, they are there. Uh, Easter celebrations, the Muslims are there. We also attend many iftars uh, before, before COVID. We had iftars almost every day with our uh, Muslim brethren. But because of the occupation, we are sealed off from uh, territories that have Jews in them. There are no Jews living in the West Bank, except in settlements which are illegal. So I, I don't know if I can do better than this. That's the, that's the situation, that's the reality on the ground. Okay, so yours is a, yours is a very sobering um, uh, response to the, the possibility of what His Eminence described as the joy of being different. Um, and I wonder then if from tests from your experience, there are um, other places around the world where we actually see success in uh, the joy of being different when it comes to sites and sustainable communities, when it comes from citizens themselves, but also when it comes from states willing to embrace that very notion of the joy of being different, which, you know, as a political scientist, I would say the, um, the ethos of, of pluralism. Yeah, and I think there are success stories uh, throughout the world that we can point to um, for, for countries recovering uh, from what we're seeing today in far too many places. And as you mentioned previously, for the, the last decade and a half, I've been very privileged to work in the Kingdom of Cambodia. And of course, just a generation ago, the global hotspot was not Mesopotamia, it was Indochina. Vietnam, Laos, and indeed Cambodia. In Cambodia, which is still internationally celebrated for its 12th century temple of Angkor Wat, fighting erupted between government forces and the Khmer Rouge in 1970, and decades of civil war, genocide, and foreign occupation followed. And as we're seeing now throughout the Middle East, North Africa, the Sahel, uh, the Cambodian Civil War it triggered organized antiquities looting and trafficking, which in turn further bankrolled uh, violence in the country. And as we're also seeing today, this cultural racketeering went hand in hand with the deliberate and systematic destruction of targeted groups and their heritage. And the cost of these atrocities in Cambodia were very high. Um, 130 Chan mosques were destroyed, all 73 Catholic churches. and over 3,000 contemporary uh, Buddhist pagodas, so I say contemporary just to separate them from, say, the Angkorian temples, along with sacred literature, statues, etc. And, you know, half a century, so half a century after this plunder and destruction, the Cambodian people are, are still rebuilding and 
recovering. But rebuilding and recovering they are. And some, certainly one of the most inspiring things I've seen was at a, an event our organization organized on the margins of the United Nations General Assembly meetings, uh, at which we were very honored to have the Foreign Minister of Iraq and also the Secretary of State of, of Cambodia at the time. And after the event, the um, Cambodian, His Excellency Chan Tani, went up to the, the Iraqi foreign minister and he said, of all the countries in the room today, we know exactly what you're going through now. And I want to tell you that for your children's generation, it will be better. And you will bring home your stolen treasures. Uh, they will be reunited just like Iraqis will one day be reunited, families will be reunited who have left as refugees. There is a bright future. We know because we've been there and we're looking forward to a bright future today and one day we'll be able to say the same about Iraq. And so um, these stories of recovery are, are possible. Um, but again, it, it will require all of us and especially our governments um, and the political will to, to do what's needed here. Thank you. Thank you, Tess, for the encouragement. And we, we have uh, just a few minutes left, and I want to ask each of you, um, if you to, to, you know, if there's anything you want to say before we conclude. I, I also appreciate from all three of you a very profound understanding of the importance of history. Um, history uh, understood in terms of the long durée of history. Uh, Mazen, that's clear in everything you're talking about. Your eminence, of course, history understood in cosmological terms and eschatological terms for those who do a bit of theology. And then Tess, for you, history, seeing historical change in the way an intergenerational transmission of either um, wounds or healing through approaches to cultural heritage preservation. So I wondered if you could each maybe say just a quick concluding statement before we sign off for, for today's session. We'll start with, we'll go in order. We'll start with you, Your Eminence. Uh, thank you, Dr. Padrov. I just want to address an appeal to all of us to protect the, and the cultural and religious monuments by uh, not making them a place of conflict and controversy, because this exactly is, is endangering their status. They may uh, become a tra target for anything. So the best way we protect the monuments is when we make them place of peace and reconciliation and understanding and love, not a place for any kind of disagreement or conflict or any, any other controversy which endangers actually the, the status and the building itself. Thank you. And thank you for inserting the word love into international relations, something we oftentimes don't hear. But thank you for affirming all of our humanity because that is oftentimes forgotten in, um, in these discussions and what we're all trying to do. Uh, Mazen, um, oh, Tess, we'll go to you next and then we'll conclude with Mazen. I'm going in order. Well, just just to, to build on the Archbishop's excellent comments, um, just to remember that so much of this heritage that we're talking about today and that we talk about in our work, it predates so many of the world's divisions and it's targeted because it's so powerful. It's targeted because it can be such a symbol of peace. When we look at the, the cities, for example, that Daesh and other violent extremists have targeted from Palmyra to Timbuktu, these were centers of faith. They were centers of dialogue that brought people together from around the region and throughout the world to have uh, conversations about difficult issues and to to discuss theology and to debate. And, and that's what Daesh was targeting when it targeted these cities. And the best way we can fight against that message is to preserve, um, preserve this past, to pass forward to future generations. Um, and as, as was so eloquently said before me, as, as a symbol of reconciliation and a tool for it as well. Great, and now, and Mazen, uh, you've, I think more than anyone really articulated the sense of pain and loss that goes with the failure to preserve and respect sites and the people to go along with them. So how about love and healing? Um, where does that come in for you as we close out this conversation? As a respect uh, to 
to the Saeed Khouri. I want to seal off this conversation with a statement that he made when he launched the Bethlehem Development Initiative. And his words, he said, this initiative shall be planted in the heart of Bethlehem and its roots shall dig deep into the soil, permanently in reinstating peace and tranquility throughout the land. This was Said Khouri's words in 2011, and working towards that, we want everybody to enjoy all the sites that we are preserving, Christians, Jews, and Muslims, because all of them have led to the establishment of these monumental places these historical places. Uh, the three monotheistic religions are built, built on top of each other from the experience of the previous uh, religions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for today's conversation. Um, for me, it's a pleasure every time I have the opportunity to, to be with you. So thank you for sharing with all of us. And also thank you for the viewers. Uh, I want to uh, thank you for your patience and also your questions. Also, um, I want to thank again the members of the organizing committee and also our partner um, with the Foreign Affairs Institute in Greece, their president, Mr. Lucas Katsonis, but also uh, the very uh, Reverend Dr. Aristarchos Krekas, who is at the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens. I think earlier today, before I had enough coffee in me, I also called you uh, Vasilis instead of Aristarchos. So, I hope you'll accept that name as well. But thank you for all of you for being here. And I urge people to come back on on July 20th for our next session, which is on cultural heritage protection and diplomacy. So it's really kind of calling states uh, directly into this conversation. Thank you all very much. And I wish you all a healthy day. Thank you. Bye-bye.